Hello friends, it's turn 22 and things are starting to hot up here in the cold, cold dominion of Jotunheim. As you can see, we've got another step of research completed. We've also had a decent blood hunting situation. There's also been a battle in Illadar, which if I remember correctly, is a location from World of Warcraft. That's our first battle with Uruk. Contact has been made with the enemy and we have destroyed them utterly. We lost two wolf riders, but when I watched this battle back, I think that was actually from friendly fire from the javelinists. So he had a reasonable amount of province defense. I think this is a relatively normal. This is probably about 11 points of province defense, maybe a few more. And uh, yeah, we kicked his ass. Also, interesting side note, if your opponent does not bring enough troops, your AI will not spend gems. My spellcasters were all scripted to cast communion spells, but they never actually did it because there simply weren't enough enemy troops on the battlefield to justify them spending gems, which is a nice detail. That's actually in there to make a mechanic called gem baiting a little less effective, which is where you send a small force in so that your opponent's a wizard AI wastes all of its gems, killing a small, a small enemy force, and then you march in with your main enemy force and they don't have any gems. You can still do gem baiting, but it's less of a less of an unsubtle mechanic than it used to be. I've also had another battle, and it is in Smotherdark, which is the cave province. We effortlessly took this. But unsurprisingly, our wolf riders destroyed them utterly. Zotses are very, very weak. They're very, very easy to kill. Also, we've had an uh, unexpected event in Pfnofia, which... Man, this sucks. That's a really bad event. I seem to be just be getting a chain of, of money-reducing events, which sucks. I mean, on the one hand, a whole lot of people die, but I don't care about that. What I care about is my bottom line. So let's have a look at the geopolitical landscape up north. These are the two territories we have conquered. These are the two armies of Uruk that I can observe. Thanks to a surprising message from Pangaea, I have reason to suspect that he doesn't have any other armies marching around. Apparently Pangaea has gone to war with him in the northwest, possibly over this throne, I'm not sure. Yeah, Pangaea just decided to send me a picture of his territory with six or five or six scouts scattered around saying, hey, look, Uruk's got no troops around. Why don't you, why don't you steal a bunch of his territory? And I was like, well, gee, I was gonna anyway, but thanks for the tip. So my current plan is to have all of my main army, including this group of wolves, march here to take this province. There's a couple of options for what he might do, as he's got an army defending his capital and an army here defending this forest. This forest army might march forwards or backwards into either of these provinces in order to attempt to retake them. That's not really a problem for me because he doesn't have very many troops in his capital. I think I can beat that. So if I can just march straight there and take his capital, that's disastrous for him. On the other hand, he might have reinforcements over here. In fact, I'm going to move this scout over here just so I can get a look at that province and the inexplicable castle that he has built between two other castles, which is just a bizarre decision. So this army might march to either of these places, or alternatively, he might want to link this army up with his capital army in order to actually try and take the fight to me. If he suspects I'm going to march across here and take this province to kind of neatly and tidily sew up the south step by step, then he might march both of these armies into this central province to combine them. If that happens, that's probably going to go badly for him because he won't have the additional benefit of his capital defenses. This army can probably beat these two armies combined. As a side note, I've also moved over most of the gems that were being carried onto this scout who's going to act as a gem caddy. He's not going to take part in combat, but he's going to dole out additional slaves to every one of my wizards after a combat, just to make sure that they have enough blood to get all over their hands. While this stealthy wolf battalion is going to come with us for flanking benefit in this potential combat, which is extremely useful as they are so fast, which means that if he hasn't scripted especially carefully, it's quite possibly our armies will both smash into the mid into each other in the middle and then the wolves will just sneak around the back and kill all his wizards, which is obviously to my benefit. This other wolf battalion, however, I'm sending into this territory to try and take. It's likely that this army is going to move, whether it moves north to link up with his other forces or whether it moves east or west to retake one of the taken provinces. If that happens, then that's a net no change, which is fine with me. That means that just means that I make more trouble for him in the south. If it moves north, then that's an additional province I'll have taken from him. And if it doesn't go anywhere, there's a chance that it will kill my wolves. His, he's got as many troops as I do, and they are stronger. But the flanking might be enough to kill his commander and get a rout, so there is a, an acceptable chance I'll win that fight. A sieged castle cannot recruit units, which means that if I do get my troops here in time, he can't spend a few turns building up his forces the way he could otherwise. As a side note, if all does go well and I manage to seize a bunch of his territory and possibly even his capital, I might actually con contemplate 
handing all of my troops from compensating to Hrunya and uh, have Hrunya run the rest of the, the combat while compensating sneaks back south to link up with other rebuilt forces. And then they're going to march over here and take this throne. I might not claim the throne immediately, but I want to have the province that it's in. Thrones that have, throne provinces with undead in often have bad, nasty effects when you claim them, such as death scaling. So I'm going to be careful about that. Also, refusing to take it but keeping the opportunity to take it later, it can be quite useful if you don't want your any anyone else on the world map to think that you are a threat. One of the mistakes I made in my second ever game, bear in mind this is my third ever match of this game, was that I, in the mid-game, seized a huge amount of territory from someone who foolishly attacked me. As a part of that, it put me in a position to rush grab three thrones that were now very available and right next to my big armies, and therefore win the, win the game within a few turns. I was just preparing to do that, when the player in position two on the rankings said to everybody else, hey, has anyone noticed that Ulm is about to win the game? And uh, I probably got coalitioned by every other player in the game who all carved chunks out of my territory far more than I could have defended. And that's kind of been the slow decline I've had since. On the one hand, that's partly my fault because I could have played a bit more subtly, I could have played a bit more defensively. On the other hand, it's also kind of my fault because if I hadn't repositioned my troops to defend and had instead actually just taken everything I had and zoomed off to those three provinces, I might actually have been able to sneak a win before anyone could stop me, even if they did start declaring war on me en masse. Anyway, that's a different game, <laughs> not this game. Anyway, that's a different match of this game, not this particular one, so it's besides the point. I'm not going to bother you with the specific details of what's going on back home. It's all the same stuff. I'm building up troops. I'm expanding my temples. I'm boosting my research. I'm, you know, site searching. It's all of those things. But the last thing I want to talk about is my research plans. So obviously, as Jotunheim, I don't have access to very good research, which is one of the reasons I picked a researching pretender. Obviously, we hit our main goal of Enchantment 5 to get the uh, Skeleton Spam communions online. And then the question is where we go next. There are a few useful goals for this nation at the moment. I've been researching alteration, but there are other two but there are two other options. Hitting alteration six will get us access to darkness, which will significantly boost the power of our undead minions. And on the way, when we hit alteration four, we'll gain access to swarm, which is very unusually a summoning spell that is in the alteration tree rather than the conjuration tree. What Swarm does is summon a huge number of very weak biting insects, which are actually troops on the battlefield, not some kind of abstract damage effect. They're very easy to kill, but they're very hard to hit, and there's a ton of them, which means that they will swarm, surprisingly enough, across your enemy and distract them a great deal, which will cause their formations to break down and often mean that they are wasting turns attacking flying insects when they should be attacking the large giant in front of them. That said, Conjuration 5 will gain us access to Howl, which is a very, very useful spell for Jotunheim. Howl is a battlefield enchantment, which means that once cast, it lasts for the entire rest of the battle and affects everybody everywhere in the battle, unless of course the spellcaster is killed, at which point it ends early. And the effect it has is to summon random wolves from the edges of the battlefield, which will attack your opponent. This is really useful for exactly the same reason Swarm is, except that the wolves, unlike the Swarm, can actually do damage as well as being a distraction. Finally, Thaumaturgy 6 is a much less important goal, but one we will probably want to hit at some point. Thaumaturgy 6 will give us access to Wither Bones, which is a very powerful death spell, which is essentially anti-necromancy. It is a large AoE spell that does a shit ton of damage to undead and only undead. There's two reasons why I want this. One is that there is a valuable undead throne over here. However, I'll probably just take it with ordinary troops before then. And the other is, of course, that to our southeast lies Ermor, the deadly undead nation who are extremely difficult to fight. If I've just now realized that these are not Ermor, these are Scalaria. That is a comp that is a mistake I have made many times over the course of this series and probably will continue to make. But ultimately, who gives a shit? Anyway, their armies are primarily undead focused, so Witherbones will be very useful against them. And since they haven't been knocked out of the game already, they'll probably be snowballing into the late game, which means that we'll have to deal with them eventually. So three valid targets. One of them I don't have to worry about very soon. One of them would be very useful soon and is a lower research goal than the other. However, hitting all six will get me two spells that I want instead of one. Alternatively, I could just go alteration four, conjuration five, and then alteration six. But I'm going to stick with alteration for now. And that should be everything I want to talk about this turn. Hello friends, it's turn 23 and stuff is hotting up in the cold, cold realm of Jotunheim. First off, we have a dire portent, which is that Pangaea has successfully cast Mother Oak, which is a global spell, possibly the first global cast this game. It's pretty simple and it's no real threat to us. However, it creates a site in his casting province, which generates 10 or I think 20 
nature gems per turn. It costs 80 gems to cast, so it pays for itself quite quickly. And after that, you're gaining huge amounts of nature gems for the rest of the game. It's it's very useful to have. And if we get the chance later, we might overcast it to try and uh, pull control of it away from him to us. Continual unsuccessful site searching is ongoing. Don't know what I pay these people for, frankly. We've also had a couple of battles against... Uruk with the ongoing warfare, but it's all against PD, so I wouldn't normally watch it, except one of them is fucking hilarious. We've also had unexpected events, which suck, and another another marker about the arena, which I'll talk about next time, probably. So, our main army successfully destroyed the province defense of this region, which is understandable. In fact, it wasn't even enough to trigger them to start their communions, so I still don't need to redistribute my gems to make that work. But this is the really fun one. So I lost a few wolf riders, but... It's hilarious to me that he lost his entire army to the world's most basic tactic, which is commonly known as flanking. So this was him attacking into our province, with our tiny amount of province defence and our wolf rider battalion. The province defence are Zotzes, which can fly, so they jumped in, which immediately disrupted his formation out of a block into more of a straight line which meant that a large number of my wolves were able to run right past the main block of his infantry. The wolves themselves do a pretty decent amount of damage in combat, but they're weak enough that these guys kill six of them before this happens, which is that the remaining, what, seven or eight of them loop right round the back, kill his only commander, immediately causing all of the rest of them to rout, and then, while routing, the wolves continue to push in, and just devour them from behind, because the wolves are significantly faster, which means they keep locking them back into combat again. It's a shame that I lost so many wolves, but it's also hilarious that he lost 40 of his relatively expensive basic infantry to just six of my shitty little goblin riders. Let's look at the war. So the main thing that we're dealing with is the fact that his main army's shown up, and it is apparently nearly 400 units strong, which is terrifying. This could mean a couple of things. One, this could be inaccurate scouting. Scouting can be up to 50% incorrect in either direction, which means that it's possible that this is an army of like 180 units, which is much more reasonable and which I could fight with this army. Alternatively, he might be using one of the many items in the game that disguises how many troops you have. There are some relatively cheap items which will significantly boost the apparent size of your army that are relatively easy to get a hold of and which he has the magic paths to create. I can't take the chance that that's the case. So instead, I'm going to move away, I'm re going to refuse to take the fight with this, because, you know, for all I know, that was his invasion army for Pangaea, and he's just accepted that he'll lose his western provinces as Pangaea takes them, and it's more important to him to protect his capital, which is understandable, because this army is enough to take his capital, probably. So that means I need to deal with this army. And the way I'm going to deal with that army is by refusing to deal with that army in any way whatsoever. The fact that I have three units moving around able to take provinces against PD relatively effectively, because remember, you can't script PD, which means that flanking tactics are, as we've seen, often effective against them. And I've got additional raiding teams heading up from the south as well. Incidentally, when I say raiding, I'm not referring to the in-game mechanic of pillaging, which literally nobody ever uses, because it's honestly more effective if you have troops in a province just to take the province and deny that income to your opponent than to siphon a small amount of income out of your province out of your opponent's provinces so here raiding refers to taking provinces with no real expectation that you'll hold them but the main purpose being to deny them to your enemy briefly we'll be able to do that to three maybe even four provinces a turn and if he's going to rely on keeping his army in a nice safe stack that's big enough to kill my army then that means he can only retake one per turn which means that he'll eventually be starved of resources to the point where he's not really able to fight back. Because this army is potentially so much bigger than my main army, I am going to do that. I'm going to borrow I'm going to borrow logic from Dota, which I used to be mega into back in the day, and switch to ratting. I'm going to be everywhere and constantly disappear into the woodwork whenever he shines a bright light on me. I thought about sending them to this province, but he appears to have done a province dump, which is where you predict where your enemy is going to go and put an extra amount of province defense in there. This means he has at least 20 points of province defense in there, so why take that risk? I can just take a much weaker province somewhere else. Maybe he'll PD dump there as well, but if he's doing that, then he's pouring his money into province defense, which is very inefficient. Generally speaking, putting too much money in province defense is a mistake that we noobs make, so who knows? However, fighting a rook is risky business for me, and there's a few ways I'm going to try and make it a bit safer over the next few turns. One is that with my research, I have made sure that I'm going to finish up Alteration 4 and then head off into Enchantment 6. 
Getting to Conjuration 5 and, or getting to Enchantment 6 will take roughly the same amount, it's about 200 RPs difference, and getting to Enchantment 6 will get me access to two spells at the same time, which will be very useful combined. We will get Grip of Winter and we will get Rigor Mortis, Water and Death spells. These broadly have the same effect, which is to blanket the battlefield in fatigue damage. Grip of Winter makes it cold, which does cold-based fatigue damage. Whereas Rigor Mortis applies essentially a debuff to the entire battlefield, where all living units just arbitrarily take 10 fatigue damage periodically. The thing is, if you combine these two spells with a Skeleton Spam Communion, then your spellcasters will spend a couple of turns summoning a shit ton of skeletons, and then everybody on both sides of the battlefield will immediately fall asleep. Your guys will be asleep, but so will their guys, which means that your skeletons, who, naturally being dead, do not sleep, can just march straight through like a combine harvester and destroy them all. It's a nasty tactic and will be very effective if I can get it online. It will require a Scrati to be casting Grip of Winter, but, you know, we'll have more Scrati by then. Speaking of Scrati, and just as an aside, this one who moved out of the capital last turn and has picked up a few Blood Slaves here, he does actually have the movement to reach all the way here, which means that I can plug him into this communion next turn. If I script him to join the communion now, then in the battle that takes place in between turns, he'll be part of this communion as a battery. Two Scrati is enough to fuel like 10 mages for most of a battle. Four Scrati is enough to fuel all of your mages for an entire battle. They are incredibly effective turbo communion batteries. They're amazing. But I will need to reserve one as a spellcaster for Howl of, Wil Howl of Winter, and anything past that I'm probably going to want to be making into a thug. I've explained this previously, but let's just mention it again. Thugs are individual combatants who have been upgraded with magic items and so on. In order to turn the tide of a battle, they supplement your troops by being incredibly tough frontliners and so on, and are just incredibly useful. Super combatants, of course, are like thugs, but more so, where a, where a thug will turn the tide of a battle you're already having. A super combatant can fight a battle by themselves, but we won't be setting up super combatants anytime soon. Scratty thugs are very effective. I'll be giving them a vine shield, which is a very effective defensive item because it locks down anyone who melees you with a vine spell. I'll also be giving them fear helmets, which are very effective, for the simple reason that what thugs really want is ways to do AoE effects. The fear helmet gives your creature fear, which means that your opponents have to make melee checks if they're around it, which means that things that are fighting it are more likely to run away in fear, obviously. And finally, the frostbrand, which we can't actually see on this character's loadout, is a melee weapon which does area effect damage. It only does AoE 1, which means it will hit one tile, which against giants is less effective. However, against larger numbers of smaller units, you absolutely desperately need a way to do AoE damage on a thug. We'll probably also give them amulets of regeneration to boost their natural regeneration to an even higher level, which will basically make them unkillable. That lengthy tangent aside, the other important tactic I need to bring against Uruk is anti-magic. Uruk are a powerful astral nation, which means that they will be casting soul slay a lot, which is uh, essentially an, a magic resistance check, and if you fail that magic resistance check, you die instantaneously. This is ineffective against armies that rely on a large number of small units, but against a giant army like mine, I have a lot invested in a relatively small number of individuals, which means I need to be casting anti-magic to boost everyone's magic resistance. Only my astral casters can do that, and unfortunately all of my astral casters have been spawning in late in the game, and have done so in this castle even further away. So it's going to be a matter of, t uh, of a couple turns before I can get Gnar to catch up with my main army. But as I've said, I'm going to be thinking like the rat. So hopefully I won't take a fight with his main army at all in that entire time. And I can get her to link up, join the communion and be protecting my guys against getting blasted into greasy stains by astral magic. I am a little bit worried about this Scratty's movement. The fact that he's passing through a terrain which another person is going to pass through is a bit questionable. The movement mechanics of the game are arcane and highly ambiguous and mysterious. And nobody really understands them perfectly. However, I'm pretty sure, and I have checked with my mentor, and she's also pretty sure, that because the movement is simultaneous and they're not ending up in the same square or each other's square, they they won't meet. So even even though he'll be passing through these squares to get to here, and this guy might take this square, that... 99% chance it works, 1% chance it doesn't. We'll find out. <laughs> Incidentally, there's a few options for him here. He might try to retake this territory. He might try to go into this territory because it's very likely that I would send my army here to take this territory. The only reason he would have to move here is if he thinks that's where I'm going and he wants to force a fight with my main army, which obviously he does. But we can get lost forever in the will they, won't they back and forth 
five dimensional chess master bullshit of, well, if he knows I'm going to move here, then obviously I would move somewhere else. So then he won't move there because he knows I'm going to move somewhere else, even though it looks like I'm going to move there. But that means he might move there anyway, because what if I know that he knows that he knows that I know that? And so on. So what I am going to do is send my my wolf squad from this army to go over here. They don't necessarily they don't re they aren't really needed over here. Even if he, he moves his capital out to here to try and head me off, which I don't think he'll do, this army has a good chance of beating it with its turbo communions. So he's probably not going to send his army here, which means that I can grab it and deny him both of his major resource suppliers to his capital on the same turn. If I lose these guys, I lose these guys. You know, it's an acceptable sacrifice, and they might kill a couple wizards on their way out. But as I said, I think the most likely thing is that he'll move here. And that also means that I will actually find out next turn whether or not this is a lie. I'll find out exactly how many troops he has, because we have province defense here. We have province defense here. We have just enough that a scout can't take either of these provinces. So if he moves into either of these provinces, the battle of him destroying the one province defense guy <laughs> will show me exactly what he has. And of course, if he moves here, he'll run into my wolves and they'll fight and we'll be able to see that way. There is another side benefit to my rat strategy, which is that if I can take his territory faster than he can reclaim it, and I definitely can because he's relying on large stacks, I'll soon be able to take four of his territories a turn unless he starts province dumping heavily. And if he's province dumping heavily, he's not also spending that gold on more troops. That means he will eventually have to split his stack in order to reclaim territory faster or r r run the risk of running out of money. If he splits his stack, that's to my benefit because I can't fight his big army. I can probably fight half of his big army. So if I can become enough of a nuisance that he splits his forces, I can possibly leverage that into destroying half of his forces. To that end, I am also spending some spare money that I'm not otherwise using on hiring mercenaries this turn. I might not get them. They are discounted for my nation, but that means that if someone else is bidding on them, they'll probably outbid me. Fortunately, the they are very expensive mercenaries, so I doubt anyone else is actually going to buy them. And they should be, I think, another set of wolf riders, which would be very useful for me. In other news, sites are site searching, blood hunting, and so on is all continuing apace, as is infrastructural development. I'm definitely going to need to send more blood slaves north soon. Fortunately, I can put them on a wolf rider and he can just zoom off incredibly fast. Or even I could put them on a Scrati who's heading in that direction anyway. <laughs> I might have forgotten a couple things. This is a big and fairly complex turn as my incredible spiderweb diagram shows, but that should be everything we need to talk about this turn. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, and share. I also stream regularly on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter for updates and announcements. If you want to contribute to my continued existence, then why not donate to me on Ko-fi or Patreon? All of the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching.